I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, our continuing look at the Obama administration's abstention in the United Nations Security Council, permitting the passage of an anti-Israel, anti-settlement resolution that states that Israeli settlements anywhere on the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, including the Old City, the Western Wall, have no legal validation and are a flagrant violation of international law. This American action was followed by a major address by Secretary of State John Kerry, who justified the administration's action by saying that settlements are a serious impediment to a two-state solution, which he considers to be in Israel's vital self-interest and essential if Israel wishes to remain both a Jewish state with a serious Jewish majority and a democratic state in which the vote is extended to every resident of Israel. Now for many in the Jewish community and for me, the Obama extension and the Kerry apology are each outrageous in both content and message and constitute a serious betrayal of the U.S.-Israeli relationship at this point in time. Well, we've been asking significant figures on the American scene to share their perspectives on the Obama abstention and the Kerry address. And we're so pleased to have on our JBS phones now from Minneapolis, a gentleman who's devoted much of his life to serving the United States and the American people, the esteemed former Republican and Independent United States Senator from the state of Minnesota, Senator Rudy Boschwitz, who among other positions he held during his two terms in the Senate, served as chairman of the Foreign Relations Subcommittee on the Middle East. Senator, thank you so much for joining us on JBS. Yeah, very welcome, Rabbi. Glad to be on. Senator, by the way, I want you to know we have a gorgeous picture of you up on the screen from when you were senator from Minnesota. You are, I'm sure you're still gorgeous, but I just want you to know the gorgeous picture is one of you when you were a senator. So imagine that in your mind's eye. <clears throat> well, I was a shotgun down there, too, in Washington, you know. Right. <clears throat> I had parties for young Jewish singles. Wow. And we started off with a couple of hundred, and it went up well over a thousand. Amazing. We did it four times a year. Many marriages. So oh, very lovely. By the way, you have a lovely bride of many years, correct? Sixty. Sixty years. Mazal Tov. That is wonderful. Uh, yeah, it's great. Good for you. Okay, so yeah. Sen Senator, uh, by the way, I want the audience to know Senator was kind enough to say that I could call him Rudy as well. But I begin with, Senator, you served on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, actually with then-Senator Kerry. How do you assess the Obama administration's decision to abstain on an anti-Israel Security Council resolution? Oh, it, it, it's absolutely outrageous. Uh, the UN is such a destructive body they, they passed 24 condemnatory resolutions of one type in the General Assembly, 24 of them during this past year, 2016. 20 of them were related uh, to Israel. Uh, and that's not new. In, in the past four preceding years, they had 97 such resolutions. 83 of them were directed at Israel. Uh, is, Israel... Uh, UN is very unfriendly towards Israel. Yes. So when the Americans uh, have been the only defense for the state of Israel in the UN, and they have used their veto since time immemorial, and for them not to do it now, when you have a body such as the UN, uh, which is so anti-Israel, it really is a a stab. Obama. Uh, Really, he said that you have my back, that uh, the Israelis have his back. Well, 
hasn't worked out that way. Yes. Um, by the way, Senator Kerry, now Secretary of State Kerry, argued that this really isn't a change in U.S. policy because there were administrations prior, and he quotes the Reagan administration as an administration which did permit uh, resolutions to be passed against Israel in the Security Council. Does that have any bearing on your thinking? No. <clears throat> the Reagan administration was very friendly. Started off on the wrong track uh, on the AWAC vote, if you recall. But from there on in, uh, the, uh, I, I don't call, recall the resolution that Kerry is talking about, incidentally. But uh, other than the AWAC, uh, uh, Reagan was extremely friendly to the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, the defenders of the vote argue that the Obama administration has been just wonderful when it comes to military assistance to the state of Israel, the Iron Dome, for example, and to intelligence sharing, and that these administration efforts render any notion that President Obama is either anti-Israel or worse, anti-Semitic, ludicrous. What do you say this represents in your mind about the Obama administration's overall attitude to the state of Israel? The, the abstention? Yes. The, the abstention was an extraordinary move. Again, the UN is, is such an unfriendly body to the state of Israel, and, and the only friend, really, including the European nations. I was uh, an ambassador to the UN Human Rights uh, Council, as it's now called. It was called Commission back then. And uh, uh, the, the European nations and all others, uh, normally, with the exception of Australia or Canada, uh, but they're very... Uh, negative with respect to Israel, and the president knows that, that only the United States is a persistent and consistent friend. So moving away from that is, is a very large step. <clears throat> the idea that, that, that uh, uh, the, all of the settlements are illegal is, is just uh, not case at all. Okay, we're going to come to that in one moment. And okay. I, apo I, I apologize to you because I think I, I sort of didn't ask the question in the right way. What I really want to know is, do you feel that the uh, Obama administration or the President Obama or that Secretary of State Kerry are in any way anti-Israel or even worse, anti-Semitic because they permitted this resolution to pass? Those who are defending the president and the secretary of state argue, yes, they permitted this resolution. But if you look at the larger picture, all of the military and intelligence cooperation, Trump, you should excuse the expression, Trump, the U.N. resolution decision. My question for you is, what's your instinct here? Do you feel that the Obama administration or the, the president or the secretary of state are either anti-Israel or anti-Semitic that they would allow this U UN resolution to pass? Well, I'm very careful about calling people anti-Semites, uh, but it certainly was a most unfriendly act. All the administrations uh, have have been uh, uh, very friendly with respect to things like the Iron Dome and military expenditures and sharing of, uh, of technology. Incidentally, it's been a two-way street, of course. Uh, Israel, uh, during my time, uh, uh, repaired uh, some technology that the Americans had, on, particularly on the F-15 at that time. Uh, it was a very unfriendly act. I don't want to deal in, in calling people anti-Semites. It was an unfriendly act, an extraordinary act, an unusual act, a first-time act that, that uh, there has been an extension in the 
Security Council by the United States. I understand. By the way, you say it well and you say it clearly. I must push you then because people who are now listening to you all over America are going to want to know what Rudy Bushwitz believes is the reason then. Let's say it's not anti-Semitic. By the way, I've said it's not anti-Semitic. I'm not sure it even should be called anti-Israel, though you, you clearly show to us, Senator, the extent to which this is a departure, a dramatic departure from U.S. policy. But someone has a right to ask you, then you've been around, you were around Washington for years and years and years, and after that, you were ambassador, you, you, you've, you're right now, you're with the Council on Foreign Relations, you're with APAC. What's going on here? Why would the president take this dramatic step that obviously injures Israel diplomatically, is going to create more problems for the peace process, not fewer, and is really going to fuel an anti-Israel rhetoric in other nations? What do you believe, you, when you talk to your bride of 60 years, what do you tell her? What do you express in your own mind? When you talk to colleagues at APAC, what's the reason you guys talk about is behind this Obama decision and the Kerry justification? Well, we're very unhappy with Obama. <clears throat> we don't think he's a particular friend of, of Israel, and the same goes for Mr. Kerry. When I knew him on the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, he had a different view. What was his view it, there? What was his it's view? The most unfriendly act. It's it's an unnecessary act. It's an unprecedented act. It it uh, you can interpret it uh, harshly, and uh, it's uh, not politic really to uh, because if you interpret it harshly, then the argument come, you, you change the nature of the argument. And yes. I wouldn't do that. Good for you. By the way, I, I was going to ask you, if people were to say to you, hey, Rudy, you are a Republican. This is a partisan play on your part. This is about Republicans and Democrats, and you're anti-Obama because he's a Democrat. How would you answer? Well, I, I certainly uh, am a Republican, and I disagree quite strongly with many of uh, the Obama policies. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm used to working in a Senate that worked in a bipartisan manner and, and uh, looked at things a little more uh, uh, with, a, with a broader eye. Yes. So that uh, I don't like Obama. Okay. Um, Senator, UN yes. Resolution 2334 states that any Jewish community on the east side of the 1949 Green Line, which was in effect until the Six-Day War of June of 67, any Jewish community beyond the Green Line is illegal and a flagrant violation of international law. Is that how you understand the legality no. of Israeli settlements? No. In, in a war of aggression, uh, which the 67 war was, in a war of aggression, the aggressor is not restored to the, an, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the status quo ante. Uh, the aggressor loses property. Lines change in wars of aggression. They always have, and that's recognized by international law. Uh, I, my father was born... Uh, in Germany, and it became a Poland, uh, because after the First World War, lines changed all over the place, and and lines do change. Uh, I was the first time I went to Israel was 1977, and I listened to Menachem Begin, who was just a wonderful orator, and he pounded the desk and and talked about uh, the fact that uh, Israel is going to defend itself, and that lines change in wars of aggression. The aggressor is not restored to the status quo ante. And, and what, what has been done, uh, the, uh, 
the around the hills of Jerusalem as an example. Uh, the uh, uh, Jordanians used to sit on those hills with field pieces and uh, bombard Jerusalem. So now they have become suburbs of Jerusalem, uh, and uh, rightfully so. And, uh, uh, and and so some of the settlements. And and interestingly, you know the Israelis who have always said, we'll give you acre for acre, and yes. we'll give you acre for acre yeah. of stuff that we keep beyond the 67 line, and it'll be up in the Galilee, which is good farmland, and it's by and large uh, occupied by Palestinians anyway. Well, those Palestinians rose up and said, no, don't make us part of the West Bank. We want to remain part of Israel. Uh, they knew what uh, side the uh, bread was buttered on, and they knew uh, that they had far more rights and far more freedom in Israel than they would ever have being part of the West Bank. Senator, do you believe in the two-state solution as an ultimate way in which Israel and the Palestinians can live in peace? Do you, in theory support a two-state solution? Well, I, I, I wish for a two-state solution, but I don't see how it's possible when you have a people who, who educate their children to hate and who glorify martyrs who kill uh, and call people who kill uh, innocent people martyrs. Uh, it's very, very difficult. And... Uh, very frankly, I think it's almost impossible. The Israelis have tried to do that very much, and they have given away more in, in some of their negotiations, and the final negotiations <coughs> with, I believe it was with Prime Minister Barak and, and uh, uh, Arafat. Uh, they were at Camp David and... and uh, Sitting in between them was President Clinton with the checkbook of the American people open and ready to sign a check, and nothing could satisfy Arafat. He wouldn't take yes for an answer. Mm -hmm. So that, unfortunately, I'm not sure that a two-state two solution. And, very frankly, uh, they all remember Sadat, that Sadat made peace with Israel, and shortly thereafter, he was assassinated. Uh, I think that, that the leadership of, of the Palestinians uh, are concerned uh, with their own well-being mm -hmm. uh, if they were to make peace with yes. Israel. So two-state solution sounds wonderful. It's not going to happen soon. I understand. Do you consider the West Bank to be Palestinian territory? Oh, you, you know, <clears throat> well, it's something. I'm not quite sure what it is, but but I know that that it should not be incorporated into the state of Israel, and have all the Palestinians on the West Bank become citizens of the state of Israel. That, that's really a non-starter. Okay. I th th many many of the settlements also are defensive in nature. You know, when, when W. was uh, governor, he was taken on a helicopter ride by Sharon. And, and uh, <clears throat> Sharon pointed out the green line and described what that was. And he said, look, Mr. President, there's, from the, the width of Israel at, at its waist is eight and a half, nine miles. And W. said, we have driveways longer than that. That's right. Texas. That's right. <clears throat> and, and, and there are certain defensive requirements uh, that settlements must also, those kind of settlements must, and the West Bank is a high ground. You've gone from Tel Aviv and the airport up to Jerusalem. It's a 25-mile curling drive up a long hill, and, and, and the West Bank is a high ground, and... Uh, of course, the, the, the plane by the 
by the sea is Israel. And so, uh, for defensive reasons, Israel must keep some of the West okay. Bank. Look, w- one more thing I want your, your comment on in terms of this entire controversy. There are those who point out that, tragically, the Muslim Islamic Jihadist Palestinian community, not necessarily the Palestinians in particular, but those in positions of leadership, be they in Fatah or be they in Hamas, have an ideology in which they are unable, not that they don't want to, it is not possible for them. It would go against who they are and what their soul is for them to ever be willing to share the land known as Palestine, because it once was under Muslim sovereignty, and there's a belief that if it was under uh, Muslim sovereignty, it can never become some other sovereign's land. And that the ultimate issue here isn't about settlements, not about borders, not about Jerusalem, not about refugees. The ultimate stumbling block here is there is an innate rejectionist mentality inside the Palestinian world. Again, not because they're bad, not because they're evil, not because they don't want it. It's not about they're not wanting it, Senator. It's about they're not being able to be themselves and to also say, we will share the land. And I've been saying over and over again, the real issue here, and it must be seen and acknowledged, that there's no two-state solution is there is a rejectionist ideology inside the Muslim leadership, the Palestinian leadership, and unless and until that ideology changes, everything else is commentary, and there can't be a two-state solution. Again... Well, I I think I, I agree with your statement, you know, but when you use the word never or ever... Uh, that's a long time, and and uh, things change, and and uh, hopefully uh, the time will come when uh, the Palestinians, you know, shortly after the '67 war, when Palestinians come into Israel and work, suddenly and quickly, the gross national product of the West Bank quadrupled, and and uh, the West Bank was in for better times, and then unfortunately the troublemakers arose and uh, uh, West Bankers were no longer welcome to work in Israel, and the West Bank has suffered. At some point, it's hopeful that leadership will arise that that sees uh, there's a commonality between uh, Israel and uh, uh, other countries in the Middle East, and we see some changes in attitude occurring now. Uh, they haven't occurred yet with, among the Palestinian leadership, but uh, we'll, see, we'll see what happens. Okay. But I understand. Coming all the way back to what happened at the U.N., the U.N. is such a destructive place. Uh, the the, the um, uh, UNESCO uh, normally adopts 10 resolutions annually, all of them are directed against Israel. The UN Human Rights Council has adopted 135 resolutions in the last 10 years, and 68 of them have been against Israel, the rest against the rest of the world. Uh, the, uh, 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 the World uh, Health Organization also uh, would would annually uh, uh, select Israel to, to condemn. Though most recently, the World Health Organization recognized the Israeli field hospitals as the best in the world, those who come where tragedy strikes and the Israelis are always first on the scene. But the UN has been very unfriendly. Yes. And, uh, and, and for the president, and the president knows that, 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 Resolution after resolution have condemned Israel. Uh, the uh, uh, UNESCO, I believe it is, has condemned uh, Syria once uh, since uh, all of 
of these problems have arisen. And uh, for the United States not to stand behind Israel and veto, as it has always done before, is a vast change. And I don't want to characterize people as anti-Semites, but I sure didn't like it. In, in my response to the U.N., I wrote something, and I, I said that a, a recent visitor arrived from Mars, and he found the world disorderly, so he thought he'd go to the World Organization and find out what it was. And after he was went to the U.N., he quickly determined that uh, there's such a state in the world because of a single small country, Israel, that occupies one-seventieth of one percent of the world's land that has one-tenth of one percent of the world's people. And um, what kind of a troublemaker is that little country? And uh, he was so upset, he jumped back into his Martian spacecraft, and off he went, destinations unknown. But, but to think of it, that a small country like this is, excites so much controversy uh, and it is the only Jewish country. Uh, I'm for Israel, and I'm going to work hard to keep it free and open and prosperous. Call out a vote to you, Senator Rudy Bakker. In incidentally, I understand recently that there are more companies on the NASDAQ, on the uh, second largest exchange in the United States, than all of Europe from Israel, more companies. Israel and from all of Europe combined. It's a remarkable story what the Jews have done there and it, uh, it, it should be a sign of leadership for the world rather than a sign for condemnation. It is wonderful to speak to you, Senator Rudy Boschwitz. You have been kind to me both on and off camera. I wish you and your bride of 60 years good health and long life, and I hope you'll let me call you often to share your yes. insight and wisdom. Thank you, my friend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The thoughts of Senator Rudy Boschwitz, former Republican and independent United States Senator from the state of Minnesota, and he served from 1978 to 1991. As always, my thanks to our director, Sloan Copeland, production coordinator, Serge Goldberg, JBS's associate director, Dara Golub, editors, Dennis Golan and John McDevitt, and to the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.